In May 1945, this man was diagnosed with stomach cancer and told he had only six months to live. He received an injection, allegedly as part of a cancer treatment. Days later, surgery revealed he didn't have cancer, only a benign gastric ulcer. Yet he and his family were never informed of the truth. The reason for this will unfold as we continue through this story. This unsettling chapter is closely tied to the Manhattan Project, a top secret government initiative launched during World War II. While its primary goal was to develop nuclear weapons, it also established a health division in 1942, tasked with understanding radiation hazards, protecting workers and the public, and developing safety protocols and treatments. Later, as the project progressed, scientists at the Manhattan Project specifically faced growing concern about the biological effects of plutonium, a key component of the atomic bomb, Fat Man, which would later be dropped on Nagasaki on August 6, 1945. While this project started out experimenting on rats, these animal tests eventually proved inadequate for establishing worker safety protocols, and the focus shifted to human subjects. By 1944, the Manhattan Project's medical team, led by Stafford Warren, concluded that controlled studies on human subjects were necessary to better understand how plutonium behaves in the human body. In line with this, they devised a controversial plan to inject radioactive materials into civilian patients across the country. Between April 1945 and July 1947, 30 individuals were involved in these human radiation experiments. Among them, 18 were injected with plutonium, six with uranium, five with polonium, and at least one with americium. These experiments were conducted at Manhattan Project-affiliated hospitals in New York, Tennessee, Illinois, and California. Researchers primarily selected terminally ill patients for these trials, arguing that their limited life expectancy, typically less than 10 years, justified their participation. Unfortunately, Albert Stevens, a 58-year-old house painter from California, his case caught the attention of those involved in the Manhattan Project. At the time, he was identified as terminally ill due to a misdiagnosed cancer. He was labeled Patient Cal-1 and became the first California patient to be injected with plutonium at the University of California Hospital in San Francisco under the false premise of a cancer treatment. He was given the highest recorded dose of radiation in the trials, a mixture of 0.75 micrograms of plutonium-239 and 0.2 micrograms of plutonium-238. The higher radioactivity of plutonium-238 made it easier for researchers to trace and analyze. Days following his plutonium injection, surgery revealed that Stevens did not have cancer, but rather a benign gastric ulcer. He was not terminally ill at all. Yet, Stevens and his family were never informed of the truth. Instead of reassessing their course of action and prioritizing his health, the researchers chose to continue using him for further experiments. Contrary to their grim expectations, Stevens did not succumb to the lethal effects of the injection as quickly as they had predicted. They were shocked that his body resisted the radioactive effects more than anticipated. Once Stevens recovered from surgery, researchers collected and analyzed his urine and stool samples for plutonium activity. Nearly a year after his injection, a classified report from the Berkeley Group titled A Comparison of the Metabolism of Plutonium in Man and the Rat was published. The abstract begins, the fate of plutonium injected intravenously into a human subject and into rats was followed in parallel studies. It turned out that on the very day Stevens received his injection, five rats were injected with the same plutonium mixture. This evidence suggests that Stevens' injection and subsequent surgery were not a result of a mistaken diagnosis and treatment, but rather part of a deliberate, controlled study. The lack of transparency in Stevens' case was not only unethical, but also created practical issues for the medical team. When Stevens expressed a desire to move away from the area, the doctors needed a way to continue monitoring the radiation levels in his body. To ensure they could collect the necessary data, they offered him $50 per month to remain nearby and continue providing stool samples. In today's terms, that $50 would be roughly equivalent to $800. 
The researchers justified this data collection under the pretext that his cancer surgery and remarkable recovery were part of the ongoing study, and they never truthfully explained why Stevens continued to be monitored for decades after his plutonium injection. Whenever Stevens encountered health problems, he returned to the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, or UCSF for free gastrointestinal exams. About 10 years after the injection, a radiologist observed rather marked degeneration in the lumbar region of Stevens' spine, along with several degenerating discs. Once in the bloodstream, plutonium circulates throughout the body, where it tends to accumulate in the bones, liver, and other organs. The plutonium trapped in these tissues remains for decades, continuously emitting radiation that damages surrounding structures. Over time, this ongoing exposure led to the bone degeneration Stevens experienced, among other health issues. For the sake of science, Stevens, a relatively healthy man, was exposed to an extraordinarily high dose of radiation, one of far exceeding the lethal dose for plutonium. Despite the severity of his exposure, there is no indication that Stevens ever knew he was the subject of a secret government experiment involving a substance that would offer no benefit to his health. Neither the staff at UCSF nor any of the doctors who treated Stevens informed him that he didn't have cancer or that he was part of an experiment. Stevens' wife and daughter suspected that he was being used as a guinea pig, but they believed that the experimental treatment had been effective. Thomas Stevens, Albert's son, continued to fill out medical forms stating there was a history of cancer in the family because his father had been led to believe that the treatment for his cancer had worked. Remarkably, despite receiving 446 times the average lifetime dose of plutonium, Stevens survived another 21 years after the exposure. Some sources even describe his survival as a physiological miracle. He passed away on January 9, 1966, at the age of 79 from cardiorespiratory failure and was cremated. In contrast, Dr. Joseph Hamilton, the researcher who administered the plutonium injections to Stevens, died at 49 from leukemia, likely caused by radiation exposure during his experiments. The 18 individuals who received plutonium injections survived anywhere from six days to 44 years after the procedure. Eight of the 18 died within two years, but all of them passed away from their pre-existing terminal illnesses or heart conditions, like in Stephen's case. Notably, none died directly from the effects of the plutonium itself, which underscores its long-term biological persistence, though not its immediate lethality. At the time, scientists justified these experiments by asserting that they advanced the field of nuclear physics and offered valuable insights into the effects of radioactive elements on humans. However, subsequent scrutiny has raised concerns about the efficacy and ethical implications of human experimentation during this period. The subjects selected for these studies varied significantly, and follow-up research was often inadequate. More troubling, however, were the ethical oversights. Most of the individuals involved were unaware of the true nature of the procedures they underwent. Only one subject consented, and the form they signed failed to adequately explain the associated risks. There is no evidence that any of the others gave informed consent. Furthermore, physicians were aware that the procedures held no therapeutic benefit and would be harmful if the patients survived. The experiments were often justified by the claim that the subjects were terminally ill. However, this was not always the case. Errors in diagnosis, procedures, documentation, and research were common, ultimately raising doubts about the validity of these experiments and highlighting their unethical nature. Decades later, these unethical practices would not remain buried. A turning point came in the early 1990s when the Albuquerque Tribune revealed secret radiation experiments from the Manhattan Project. This prompted President Bill Clinton to form the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments and led Secretary Hazel O'Leary of the Department of Energy to launch an investigation. By 1995, a Department of Energy report exposed the experiments, offering ethical judgments and recommendations. In 1997, new laws were passed requiring informed consent transparency and external reviews. Families of victims were compensated and secret human testing was banned. As these revelations came to light, 
the full extent of the harm inflicted on the subjects became evident. The 1995 report from the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments emphasized that the patients involved were never expected to benefit from the injections. In many cases, the injections caused far more harm than anticipated. For example, scientists initially believed that 90% of the material would be excreted by the body. However, a 1946 study by Edwin Russell and James Nixon, titled Distribution and Excretion of Plutonium, found that nearly 90% of the plutonium remained in the body, mostly in the bones, for years. When the documents about human experimentation were made public in the mid-1990s, one journalist remarked that this information would force historians to rewrite part of the history of the dawn of the atomic age. It's crucial to carefully examine the role of human experimentation in the legacy of the Manhattan Project. Bill Holmes, Stephen's grandson, said, the people who did this to my grandfather only had to ask themselves how they would feel if they were in his place. Any code of ethics or scientific experiment involving humans must, it seems to me, begin and end with that very simple question. The story of Albert Stevens serves as a haunting reminder of how science, when unchecked, can cross moral lines with devastating consequences. While the Manhattan Project changed history, it also exposed the dark side of scientific experimentation. It's a crucial lesson on the importance of consent, transparency, and ethics in research, because without them, progress can come at an unbearable cost.